welcome to this Vector GB web live session on data centric systems and digital engineering. My name is Ian Cunningham, I'm a technical specialist in the UK for uh, systems engineering and also diagnostics. Uh, I'm running another session on, on diagnostics during the event. I, I hope you're able to, to join me there. So let's, let's quickly have a, a recap on, on how we've got to having data centric systems in cars. So we, yeah clearly, and, and, and also trucks and, and off-road machinery. This is a, a, a growing area um, that, that we're having to contend with during our, our daily engineering. And, and then see how digital engineering supports the development of those. Well, if we go back 40 years or so, we had island system single ECUs that did a single thing that didn't talk to anything else. So fuel injection controllers or uh, ignition controllers that were completely standalone, didn't even really talk to each other, although maybe they, they just started to, uh, and people were really starting to put them in, in together. And this led, of course, to systems integration where we've got limited data shared by ECU. So this is where transmissions were able to request a torque reduction from the engine when they were shifting gear to, to smooth out the, the transmission gear shift. Around 10 years on, from the introduction of systems or start of systems integration, we really got to systems engineering. So starting to think about vehicle data holistically. So the vehicle is a single pool of data from which we could establish functions. Coming on from there, we start to, of course, have increased control like uh, electronic stability control and lane keep assist systems. Um, and this is all based on sharing of data between systems. So we start to have system as systems. So we start thinking about our braking system or a chassis system in isolation, we start to integrate them. And also outside the vehicle, we start to think about the wider uh, environment of, of the vehicle um, and, and things like uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to infrastructure communication uh, started to be really uh, worked on in, in this kind of time period. So uh, this is where we start to uh, um, really see the, the boundary of our, our system expanding. So from here where it was very very rigidly defined. Now it, here it's it's you know what, where does our system start and end? Does it end or start in lower low Earth orbit orbit with uh, GPS or Galileo satellites? Maybe, who knows? And this gets us to the modern day where we really are looking at the first generation of intelligent systems. So we got data centric algorithms like neural networks or fuzzy, fuzzy logic controllers and AI, a, a delivering AI based control. So really um, starting to see algorithms taking over the control of the car from, from the driver. So that's, um, that's, that's where we are in terms of the evolution and the rise of data centric systems. So how does digital engineering come into this? Well, traditionally, of course, we've picked best in class tools. We've done our requirements maybe in a, in a specific tool, our functional safety, our architecture in a specific tool. But we've caused then data islands and data shepherding. What does this mean? Well, maybe our requirements management tool doesn't really integrate that well with our functional safety process. So we're relying on people extracting data and sending it to people in functional safety who will do some work and they'll send it back. Um, but the requirements people, they they don't have an interface that can import maybe what comes back from the functional safety people. So they have one tool open on one side, they have maybe email even, and their requirements tool open on another side, and they're transferring manually through their head and their hands the data from the email, or maybe speaking just directly with the functional safety person, interpreting their understanding. Uh, and trying to capture that into there. And the same thing happens through the whole system. And sometimes maybe you get some nice integration, but yeah, mainly the job of engineers is to shepherd data through the process rather than to develop a product in a, in a single environment. So what we do with digital engineering is we put all these pieces together, okay? So we end up with a data model that supports all the tasks we want to do, as well as supporting us as engineers working collaboratively um, and doing things like functional safety, tracking change requests and, and releases, and also test data, and, and getting this all into one place. So digital engineering provides a data-centric approach. So it brings our 
working environment into the 2020s, away from the, maybe if we're lucky, 1990s type integration that we typically see. And, and 1990s type integration is the kind of thing you'll get with OSLC as well. So OSLC is, is not very good uh, at, at linking across versions. So I may have a baseline in my requirements tool. I have versions of architecture. I have versions of wiring. Trying to link up the relationships between all those different versions using a technology like OSLC would really be quite complex. So we really need a single data model that can, can hold everything. And this is the, the data centric approach that we're talking about. So we need a data model which is defined and, and structured and describes our data. And the data then describes our hardware, our software, and of course our vehicles. And to build this data, to, to refine this data, we need a collaboration platform so that a number of us can, can work together. We don't design and, and develop a vehicle by ourselves. We also need to consider things like versions, um, maybe review and vote functions, and what's the lifetime of a, of a version? Maybe for one product, it has a very short lifetime and we need to bring the new stuff in. Maybe in another product version, this version will continue for, for some time. Okay, There's nothing wrong with our version zero, our first initial release, from the perspective of, of one product. But another one, we need to increment for some reason. So what do we need to capture in, this, in our data model to, to make all this happen? Well, of course, we could start with just text. But really, what we want is a formalized language to describe everything. So we have clear, structured, consistent data. And we should def define things once. So we should have types that allow us to convey a, a, a single piece of information and take this through our model. We also want to have consistency checks, online checks, to make sure that what we're doing matches some rules about what our, we want to get out of our process. We also need to consider life cycles. How mature is our data? What process stage are we at? Is this data that anybody can use because it's released? Or is this data which is still in high flux and really um, should only be being used or, or touched by the people who are directly working on it? This also brings in concept of version management. Um, of course, once things are released, we want to reuse them. We don't want to be redeveloping things over and over again. We want to be able to refer to an original definition of data. We shouldn't be cloning things and, and maybe then causing duplication of data, which gives us potential inconsistency. We need roles and rights. If there's a number of us working somewhere, probably only certain people should be performing certain operations. So we need a roles and rights mechanism. We also need to be able to extract data. We need to be able to get data out to share with our process partners when we're at a stage where we're ready to share the data. And of course, we need to be able to communicate on our data quite often in diagrams. Engineering data is quite often able to be understood better in, in diagrams than it is in um, just in, in, in text or, or uh, tables. They still have their place, of course. We need to be able to link our data. So maybe with if we're bringing requirements in, we need to be able to link those requirements to understand how they're being delivered by our system. This gives us traceability. It also helps us with our understanding. So why do I have this thing? Well, oh, I've got this requirement. Or how do I get this requirement in my system? Ah, oh, well, I have this thing, this function, this hardware, this whatever it is. And that's what delivers me my requirement. And this also brings us to mappings. So we need to be able to structure our data and, and capture dependencies and explicitly model those dependencies. We shouldn't be guessing that just because something has the name break in it, that it will sit on the braking ECU. We may not even have a braking ECU in a, in a modern vehicle. It may be called something else entirely. So then where does the software that called brake go? Um, so we should have explicitly modeled dependencies that we can analyze and make sure we have the right coverage that we've determined we need, get our traceability in a consistent way, have navigation as simply as possible, make it as simple as possible to understand what's going on, and of course make it easy for the people making these dependencies. So it shouldn't be some horrible complex thing, it should be something simple like a drag and drop. We also when we consider variants and product lines, should be engineering one set of data and then cutting out subsets to describe a variant or a product line. We shouldn't be having to create one, two, three different things with lots of common content because here's where something will get changed in one, 
It may get changed in two, it may probably not get changed in three. And now we have a problem because we needed to make that change across one, two, and three. If we've just copied data, we, we start to cause the problems of having silos again. We're just making silos within our data though. So we're kind of creating the, the old problem in a new way. Once we've been able to, to structure that data and decide what um, relates to particular variants and product lines, we need to unambiguously determine the content for that context. So we need to be able to kind of turn on and off variants when we're doing analysis um, and, under, and be able to extract data just for that variant unambiguously. So we need to be able to unambiguously give data to our process partners. We don't want to be um, duplicating data, so we want to be able to reference attributes where we want to uh, reflect them. So if we want to reflect a, a weight or, or something somewhere else in the model, we shouldn't be copying the value and, and putting it over here. We, we should, of course, be using some referencing mechanism. So we should be able to reference attributes and also diagrams and charts and tables because our placeholders, this referencing mechanism, will always be as up-to-date as the data. We won't introduce staleness, we won't cause new data silos. And what we should be able to get to, we should be able to get to the model being the specification. Um, and in this case, we actually are able to get along without requirements at all. The model itself ex will express everything and capture everything that we want to do. So we'll have a single point of truth for everything. So if we think about um, how we can establish traceability, uh, there's two important questions, how and why. So how do I do this? Why do I have this? And we can answer this with traceability. So if we do have some requirements, maybe legal, legal requirements or, or features that we want, need to deliver, we'll typically have some software, especially in the case of features. And we need to say, well, how do I get a particular requirement in the vehicle? Ah, well, this requirement is delivered by this sensor. So how do I get it? It's there. How do I get this one? Ah, that's there. How do I get this one? It's there. I can now run a coverage analysis. So if I've explicitly modeled these relationships, I can, I can see, but I can also detect automatically that I've got two requirements that don't have anything. And also I have a lot of software it doesn't appear to be doing anything right now because it doesn't fulfill any requirements. So why do I have this software here? Oh, it, well, it's because I have this requirement. Why do I have this one? Because I have this. Because, why do I have it? Oh, because I have this. And the same with the hardware. So if I bring hardware into the picture, why do I have this sensor? Well, it's because I have this sensor software function and that's because I need to deliver this requirement. What does this requirement mean? How do I get this requirement in? Well, I have this software. How do I get this software in? Well, I, I have this sensor here as well. So going down the way, I'm answering the question, how back up the way I'm answering why? And this, this is our, our traceability that we, we have, that we establish in a, in, a, in a good data model. So we really important, we need to be able to distinguish software from hardware. So having just an abstract functional block doesn't help us here. So if we know we have software, we can look for software that isn't related to hardware. So if we have software that isn't related to hardware, I'm afraid it isn't happening in our, in our system. If we go into more detail, then we can think about specific needs we might bring in in the, in the software and hardware level. Of course, there's other, other um, levels we want to think about and we have specific needs there, but modern architectures in automotive and related industries, we are introducing service-oriented technology, so we need to capture the description of services and deployment of those services, whether they're onboard or offboard, and how we will um, discover those services, how we'll bind to them, how we will work if they're not available, and so on. So we, we need to be able to work that service concept. We need to think, especially if you have offboard uh, things or mobile devices, how we integrate those into our system. So again, where's our, where's our system end? Um, we have modern technologies we need to consider like Ethernet or wireless links. Um, switch network technologies come with Ethernet. And of course, not everything will be Ethernet and IP for some time. We'll also need to support CAN and LIN and even FlexRay in some cases, perhaps. In terms of the software, 
if we're doing service oriented, there's a good chance we'll also want to cover Autosar Adaptive. One of my colleagues, Stephen Waldron, has a session on Autosar Adaptive. Um, he'll be able to give you much more, more need on, information on, on the need that's driven this and, and what the, the latest state is in that session. But one thing we need to be able to do is integrate adaptive and classic software components into a single software architecture. We don't have an architecture which is all adaptive. Um, we need to in interface it to classic software components. So we're not replacing it, we're augmenting. So I need to be able to say, well, I have this classic software component which provides an interface which my adaptive software component will bind to via a, a service interface. And based on this, I will derive the communication between the ECU or high performance computer possibly that carries my adaptive components and my classic ECU that carries my classic components. And in the hardware, my adaptive software components are probably going to go onto a high performance computer. So I need to think about execution contexts and virtualization potentially. I need to think about virtual switches as well as real switches in my hardware and the cores um, of my microprocessor or microcontroller that I'm going to, to use. I'm going to have different execution contexts. I want to link those up with inter-process communication within my hypervisor. And then I want to be able to extract ECU extracts or manifests for adaptive and other exports, of course, for other, other needs in my process. So I, I have some real uh, needs, uh, not just in, in the in the breadth of the data I need to accommodate, but also in the detail, the depth of the data that I, I need. So, and this is just in the, in the software and hardware level. Of course, there's other things that I need to, to capture unambiguously as, as well in other layers. So in wiring and in um, functional safety, there's, there's obviously lots of stuff I want to capture there. And this brings us to a collaboration platform. So yes, during development, everybody is in the same boat with a collaboration platform at last, hopefully. So what we want to do here is have many people working with a single source of data collaborative working with rights and roles management so only certain people are able to do certain tasks, a ticketing system so we can manage work and track work and understand what change request maybe has led to what changes and why something was changed, so how and why again, but with, with tickets. And also having work in progress protection, so a check-in, check-out style of, of protection. So as I'm working on something, no one can pull the rug out from under my feet. I need to make sure, of course, multiple projects are able to be handled here because I'll be working on one project, maybe the person next to me is working on, a, on another project while I'm working collaboratively with, collaboratively with someone on the other side of the world. Um, I need to be able to import and export my data in industry standard formats, whether that is for communication and software or for wiring or, or extracting requirements maybe from the model. But overall, what we need to think of is my data is my single point of truth. My data should, um, my system, my digital engineering platform should facilitate everything I want to do. It should give me the data model with a, a, a single way to access that data. Um, not just me, my colleagues across many sites to, to enable us to work with one set of data in a single process, embodying best practice in, into what we're doing. So applying systems thinking, answering those how and why questions and getting the traceability and the transparency that we need when we have data centric systems. And this is what we do with Prevision. This is Vector's answer to meet the challenges that we've, we've talked about. So I don't want to talk too much about Prevision now. If you want to know more about this, then please let us know. In the meantime, I'm happy to take your questions.